The Mustang is in the news again. This machine gained fame as a locomotive buster and was one of the originators of intruder patrols. It is also the only Allied fighter to have penetrated the land of the Third Reich. Fast and maneuverable, the Mustang is now being modified for use as a dive bomber. This is what an intruder plane looks like at the receiving end. Meet leading aircraftman Chapek, or in English, Spotty, who has taken part in night bombing raids on Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, Stettin and Bremen. Most popular member of a Polish bombing squadron, he has been mentioned in the special order of the day by the Polish commander-in-chief. Where Czapek came from, nobody seems to know. But just over two years ago, he arrived half-starved at a training station, from whence he was transferred to his present unit with the squadron. Officially enlisted as an AC-2, he has now been promoted to LAC. During the briefing of the Polish squadron for their first raid, incidentally on Berlin, Czapek was present. When they arrived at their bombers, Czapek was already installed and refused to get out. So he went with them. Over enemy territory, he was given oxygen, just like the rest of the crew. And over Berlin, he took up his post by the bomb aimer. After that, he made many operational trips. Czapek always attends roll call, taking up his position in the ranks. And as his name is called out, he barks. Well, for the moment, cheerio Czapek. Good luck and good hunting. Gibraltar. What vital help this piece of solid rock has rendered the United Nations, history alone will reveal. In the meantime, however, let us see an industry which has made Gibraltar one of the most important centers of our supply routes to the Middle East and North African campaigns. Out of the holes of ships just arrived from Britain, large crates are unloaded onto trailers waiting below. Inside, packed tight, are component parts of the latest type of that remarkable aircraft, the Spitfire. Tractor and trailer lose no time and are soon speeding on their way to the compound where other aircraft are to be seen in various stages of construction. A check is made as the crates are positioned for unloading. First, the fuselage is pulled out and put on a trestle by the Spitfire Erection Party, the unit responsible for the whole job. While the fuselage is being fixed, other men unpack the main planes. And still more are at work on the propeller. The unit are renowned for their teamwork and the speed with which the job is done is truly amazing. The aircraft, when they arrive, have their engines installed and the tailplane on. The rest of the components are fitted here. The time taken up to the present scene is approximately 10 minutes. From here, the machine is moved into another compound where all pipes and wires are joined and the armament installed, after which ammunition is brought and the cannons are tested. Last of all, the aircraft is seen in the running-up department and passing out with colours joins the long line of waiting Spitfires for the final test in the air. Men of a crack African squadron await below to fly the aircraft straight to the field of operations, wherever they are most needed. And so ends another story, in which Gibraltar proves again the vital part she is playing in the war against bestiality. From all the newly acquired aerodromes in North Africa, every available Allied bomber takes to the skies. Their mission, Pantelleria. For one month, this island was subjected to terrific bombardment. But on June the 11th, the signal for surrender was observed, and the first soil of Italy collapsed before the victorious allies in a spirit of unconditional surrender. The result can be said to be a major victory for the RAF. It's an early morning in the Western Desert. Any morning, in fact, in the last months of 1942. Vic Vic Squadron was a small unit in the great force which pursued Rommel across the wastes of Libya and is camped somewhere between El Alamein and Tripoli 
before the collapse of the Axis forces in Africa. As the blazing desert day begins, ground crews strip off the camouflage covers which hide the tank-busting hurricanes. The squadron has been moving forward for weeks now, a day or two here, and then on to a new place just like this, but nearer to Tripoli. The ground crews are always busy when the aircraft are not flying. They can only relax when the kites are away, and that can be a pretty anxious time too. This morning, as usual, there is plenty of work to do on the Hurricanes, those wonderful all-purpose machines. The Hurricanes started life as a fighter, and with the Spitfires, damaged the enemy mightily in the Battle of Britain. There are many modified fighter versions. Then came the Hurry Bombers, and now a new and formidable type, the Hurricane 2D, the Tank Buster. It is armoured with two 40mm cannons slung under the main planes. These, the largest bore weapons yet fitted on any flying aircraft, weigh only 320 pounds. They fire two and a half pound shells, and the aircraft also carries two 303 machine guns, a devastating total of firepower. The Hurricane 2D is part of our answer to the German tank warfare technique, and a pretty sound answer too. We've got plenty more tricks like this in store, just waiting till they're wanted. Quite a lot of any man's time in war is spent waiting, waiting until he's wanted, waiting to go into action. This very moment some tank busters are wanted in a hurry to go where the enemy has put some rear guard tanks to harass our forces. The pilots rush out to the machines. Engines burst into life. Chucks away, the can openers have a job to do, which won't wait. They taxi out. And roar across the sand into the sky. Most of the tank busters' pilots are old desert campaigners, for their aircraft were first in action in June 1942, after months of experimental work. In the first year of the Alamein Offensive, they accounted for 19 enemy tanks, and during all the long triumphant pursuit, they have been doing brilliant work. Their job calls for skill and courage of a high order. Low over the desert they fly, low over the mechanized columns of our advancing army. Soon they have to climb to a great height to cross the dead ground between us and the enemy. Target below. The hurricanes peel off and swoop down to the attack. The tank is blazing now, finished, knocked clean out of the war by the tremendous power of fire from the tank buster's cannons. The job has been well done. And so the flight reforms and heads for home. For the little camp, which wherever it may be, is the centre of the squadron's life. The aircraft carrier Bern rejoins the United Nations. The only ship of its kind in the French fleet the Bern was interned in Martinique by the local authorities after the collapse of France. This ship, though of medium tonnage, is a most welcome addition to our overtaxed fleet of aircraft carriers. The Bern now joins the other units of the French Navy. We wish her good luck and good hunting.
first a hurricane, and now the Spitfire becomes a maid of all work. The latest pictures of the world's finest fighter shows her adapted for close support shallow dive bombing. In its new form, carrying one 250 pound bomb and four cannons, the Spitfire becomes an additional threat to Axis transport, supply dumps and shipping. As yet, a South African wing composed entirely of South African pilots is the only one using these new Spit fighter bombers. They have been carrying out great work both on the 8th Army front and across the Adriatic Sea into Yugoslavia. In 1938, the British public first heard of the Lockheed Hudson. Today we learn that this aircraft is going into honourable retirement. In four years of war, the Hudsons have been everywhere, seen everything and done everything. They have fought with fighters, bombed, depth charged, patrolled, photographed, ferried and even trained. They came to our help in the early days when aircraft were none too plentiful. And in most of the great achievements of coastal command, Hudsons played a leading part. Perhaps the most famous exploit in their long and brilliant career was performed early in the war, when one of these aircraft depth charged a German U-boat and forced her to the surface, receiving the surrender of the entire crew. The submarine was the first to be captured from the air and was later brought into a British port, giving us much valuable information. Let us pay a tribute to this gallant little aircraft which had it not been for the British mission that visited the United States in the spring of 1938, might still have been a harmless commercial transport, the Lockheed B-14. At an aerodrome in Britain, the Lorraine squadron prepares for a low flying raid over France. The crews manning this squadron are composed of Frenchmen who escaped from their country before and since the occupation. Trained by the RAF, these men, most of whom have already been condemned to death by their quisling government, were never asked to take part in bombing their country. They volunteered, realizing the magnitude of the task shared by them in releasing the world from certain slavery. It should not be difficult to imagine their feelings as they take off, perhaps to land a bomb on their own homes. But it is the spirit of these men and those of all the United Nations which justifies the hopes of a people destined to remain under Nazi rule for more than four years. And so with the spectre of victory shadowing their machines, they fly to their target, a power station in the suburbs of Paris. <laughs> 